I'm Chris, and I'm going to introduce you. Cool. Uh, I've just been using first names all day. Sounds good. Brittany. Yeah. Cool. Does someone explain timing to you? Nope. You have 20 minutes total. You can use all of your 20 minutes for speaking and take questions outside. So it's or, 20 oh. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Uh, we've been doing hour and half hour talks, yeah, so you get an hour slot. So you get 15 minutes total. You can use all of them for speaking and take the questions outside, or you can stop sooner and take questions in here. Okay. Um, someone asked a question, please repeat the question, because... No the, way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to introduce you, tell a joke, make an announcement, and get out of your way. Sounds good. And it's 1700. Okay, folks, time to get started. For anyone who hasn't heard, party data uh, starts at 9 p.m. Enter from the terrace level, that's the T in the elevators, one floor up from here. Beer and wine are free. Uh, you get two mixed drink tickets, and top shelf booze will cost extra. Uh, Brittany is going to tell us about defending against robot attacks, and I need trivia questions to give away swag. Um, the Forbidden Planet is a classic science fiction movie from the 50s. Uh, introduced Robbie the Robot, which is kind of a pioneering thing in sci-fi sci movies. This movie was based on a famous, let's say, book. What was it? Oh, the Tempest. Who said that? I can't see you behind the light. Okay, you you win a, a swag. <laughs> no, this one gets thrown. <laughs> Take it away. Perfect. So hi everyone, I'm Brittany, and I'm here to equip you to defend against robot attacks. So over the last five years, I've been in a number of research labs that have equipped me to talk about this topic. Um, sorry? Oh, sorry. Is that better? Okay, sorry. Um, okay, or I'll just do this because I'll probably wander around a bunch. Um, but yeah, so the last five years, I've been researching all sorts of things about robots. Uh, first, I started in an autonomous agents lab where I taught robots to downhill ski, um, which prompted many people to be fairly pissed off because they thought that was their robo robot apocalypse plan, was just move to Canada where it's too cold for robots. Well, apparently they thought it would work for robots too, um, but when you put robots on skis, they can't really... You know, you can't get away from them. Um, and then once we did that, you know, we had this cute robot with a toque and a sweater, and everybody's like, this thing's so cute, and wanted pictures with it. And being a researcher, I was like, well, but this whole project is about robots balancing on dynamic terrain and getting them to go across various types of snow. Why are you taking pictures? Then I realized these people were obsessed with how cute robots were. And I was like, wait, how can I exploit that? How can I fuck with people using cute robots? Right, that's my thought. And then what happened is now I'm in a master's in a security and privacy lab where my advisor actively encourages me to see how I can fuck with people using robots. Um, but as part of my community service, I now also have to talk about how to defend against my research because the rest of my lab mates are terrified of what I do. And another reason I'm doing this talk is because pop culture is not accurate. Um, it's to the point where I go to movies with the rest of my lab, and as soon as I see a robot on screen, everybody stares at me to see what my reaction is. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, I'm usually like super excited and full of glee and just like <gasps> amazing, even if it's the killer robot that's actively killing someone. Um, <laughs> so this is a thing. And then afterwards, I give them a huge rant about how the robot, you know, killing somebody was not accurate. That's not how that tool works. It's not how those graspers work. And um, yeah, so I wanted to help equip people to maybe defend against these evil robots in a better way. And, you know, so this is part of it, is this is what I spend most of my time uh, doing, is looking at these robots. So combinations of ones that exist in popular culture and uh, the rest I actually deal with in my lab. Um, hopefully you can tell the difference between which one's which. And the other thing too is I've done a number of these talks about robots and I found that um, I often argue with people what a definition of a robot is. And so for this talk, we're talking about something with physical embodiment. Uh, so it does have to have a body. If not, it's an artificial intelligence. It's not a robot. 
Um, if it doesn't have sensors and actuators, again, it's an AI. It doesn't interact with the world. It doesn't move things. It's not a robot. It's just an AI. And I know I'm picking on AI, but if the robot doesn't have AI, it's just a machine. So that's an important part uh, that I distinguish when I do my research as well. So <laughs> I like starting with Roombas because they're the base case. Everybody knows what they are. The, the name is familiar. Um, but the thing that's changing is that most of the Roombas I deal with now have 1080p HD cameras, directional microphones, motion sensors, and all of these other things. Um, and they're often being marketed as guard robots, not just vacuum robots anymore. Actually, this one, if you see its box, it says um, that it guards your home, it takes video, it takes pictures, it'll, you can uh, have everything back up to the cloud, of course. Um, there's like two apps you can download, and then the last thing it does is vacuum. So it's not even the focus anymore. Um, and with this, these things have Wi-Fi connectivity, obviously, so you can uh, see what it's doing through the app. The app lets you take the videos and the pictures. But of course, everything's uploaded to the company's cloud storage before it gets to your phone, so you're like man in the middle as soon as you use it, which is kind of fun. Um, so they can see inside your house, it's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and then there's the motion detection. But my favorite thing about this one is it actually has an open access point with no security on it whatsoever, so you can kind of just access it whenever you want, whoever you are. Uh, so if you get close enough to it, you can just like see into people's homes. Um, so yeah, this is what we're going to be talking about as a base case. Uh, and essentially, this also accounts for all the robots that have camera, microphone, and are able to move in a space. So the first attack is visible spying. You know the robot's there. Uh, the best scenario I'd like to tell people with this one is imagine you are in an office, and your boss has bought this Roomba or set of Roombas for in your space. What happens when all of a sudden the boss connects, to, connects the robot to the Wi-Fi, has the app on their phone, and watches you while you're working? Maybe they make sure you're at your desk after every single um, break. Maybe they make sure you come into the office at the right time. These robots can be used to monitor exactly what you're doing in your workspace. Several other things that I've seen people use these robots for is uh, parental micromanagement. Like, ha parents will use these to make sure their children aren't having people over, um, are getting their homework done on time, are doing their chores, this sort of thing as well. So all of a sudden it becomes like a full uh, spying robot inside your home too. Or maybe your spouse looks, looks through it to make sure you're home too. So these are attacks that I kind of think about and that we're gonna try and defend against uh, right away. Um, another one is in uh, security probing your environment. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do in the lab um, and why I'm not allowed to leave the robots unattended anymore um, is because I will use the robot to see what people are doing or who's in the lab to see if it's even worth uh, you know, getting out of my apartment and putting on pants. So I'll like, uh, log on to the robot, check everything out, and then go in after. But the other thing, too, is I've used these robots to check if people's computers are unlocked, um, to check uh, what information they have on their whiteboards. Um, I've used it to see if people have public calendars in their, one of my friends had one of these. Uh, I used it to see what was on their calendar, to see when they'd be home, to see if we could hang out. Uh, <laughs> so there's a bunch of ways you can use these. And yeah, so of course, information collection. I also use it to like listen to people, hear, hear what they're doing, see what they're doing. Um, so all of a sudden, Roomba's not just a vacuum. It's a little creepy. Um, and the basic defenses are these. So for the first thing I suggest is definitely um, sanitizing your space. And it sucks. But, you know, making your home look like a show home where there aren't personal details around really helps defend against people using these robots to get your personal information, see where you're going to be, what you're doing, that sort of thing. Um, it's super simple. Put the robot away. <laughs> um, a lot of people don't do this. Um, so, again, this friend, I suggested, you know, put the robot away, um, especially... Um, in a closet or something, because often these things don't have a lot of pressure to be able to move heavy things. Um, so that's a simple thing people can do. Turning the robot off isn't easy. Um, I think out of the now close to 15 robots I have, two have power switches. The rest don't. Um, the rest, you actually have to run out their battery uh, to be able to turn them off. Or you have to take, a, take out the battery completely or destroy the battery or separate it somehow from the robot. Um, 
Like, there's one robot I have. It's a tiny capsule one, and I put it on my desk, but it's got open Bluetooth, or it has Bluetooth capability, and as soon as anybody downloads the app, connects to the robot, they can control it. So, of course, I'd been messing with everybody in my lab so much that one of my undergrads decided that what they wanted to do was get back at me. And so what they did was they connected to the robot while it was locked in my drawer. Like, I f had it physically in there. I locked it. They, they didn't know how to lock pick yet. I fixed that, but now that's a problem. Um, <laughs> but what they did was they connected to it, hid, and so when I came into the office, all of a sudden they have this robot, like, moving around inside the desk, and I couldn't figure out what was happening. It freaked me the fuck out. So, I mean, now, not only do I have to, like, try and turn the robot off, run out the batteries, uh, put the robot away, I actually have to restrain it inside my desk, so I had to make it, like, a custom box to fit in. <laughs> so, not great. Um, the last sort of step to defend against Roombas is to add obstacles. So, the bright lights help, uh, because if it can't see anything, it's probably, uh, at least some of its senses are taken out. My favorite way to fuck with my Roomba is carpet. Um, I actually have a really like nice shag carpet. It's like two inches of shag. It's like super fluffy, and no matter what, it gets stuck on it. Like it beaches itself on the carpet no matter what. And so now what I have is I have the carpet, um, like the charging station is on the far side of the carpet, so as soon as it like tries to get away, it just gets stuck. And I've had to cut it out of the carpet. The carpet's ruined, but it, you know, it helps. Um, the other thing too is uh, black carpet, putting it around the, the robot, or black masking tape, um, because a lot of these robots have um, edge detection and they don't want to fall off a cliff. So as soon as they see the black uh, black tape, they think that it's a cliff and it gets stuck. And it's like, help! I don't know where to go. Um, so pretty basic. Doors, baby gates, just like keep it the fuck in. Um, but my favorite defense beside the carpet is pocket change. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I actually used to compete in, in robot Olympics competitions where we'd have universities from all over the world come in, and I think there were like 25 or something, um, and top level robotics competition. And one was balancing on uneven terrain, which is why we end up doing the skiing thing eventually. But what they have is this like little platform, and you have these humanoid robots that are like that big, and they tried to climb up. And eventually, you know, we got the software to the point where everybody could do that easy, no problem. And we're like, how do we make this harder? And so the one prof is like, here, I got this. Grabs in his pocket, throws on pocket change. He's like, it's harder now. And I get, like, it was hilarious. Every robot fell as soon as it would get on the pocket change. Um, we also threw pencils on there and other tiny things. Does that mean 10 minutes left? 50. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so honestly, uh, tiny things um, can really fuck up a robot. Even some of the bigger robots, um, the ones that are like, so we call teen size robots my size. <laughs> um, the, like, if they're within an inch of my height, they qualify for the teen robot league. It's really fun. I'm really short. Um, but these robots also still fall on these, like, tiny little things. Like, if you have a handful of, like, jacks, I know one, no one has those anymore, but if you did, it'd fuck up the robot's day. Um, if you ever read uh, the book Robopocalypse or Robot Genesis by Daniel Wilson, um, that's one of my favorite things is uh, that they talk about how, yeah, the robots really can't get past rubble, so they just, like, stones and stuff. Um, but then, yeah, so these are basic attacks, basic defenses. But this is one that almost accidentally happened in the lab with my use of a robot, is um, I was taking video of various things with the robot in the lab, and one of the other women in the lab came around the corner, and the robot got a direct upskirt shot. Thankfully, she's wearing shorts, and we were best friends, and we were able to talk about like how I now need to put recording uh, signs all over the office. But this is the thing, is... Say you're in a situation, again, where we talk about a, uh, somebody in your office maybe having access to an app that controls the robot and they're able to see the video through it. All of a sudden, these robots can be used for sexual harassment, like walking around trying to get those upskirt shots, trying to get um, those other views, or, you know, use the, uh, take the pictures 
and use those against people for blackmail or something. This is a huge issue. And unfortunately, I don't have great defenses against this one, so if anybody has any suggestions, please find me after. But I think the best thing here is just awareness, um, awareness that these robots could be used for something like this. And remember, we're still talking about a Roomba, right? And this is another one uh, that I did get working is um, multiple robots. Say you have six Roombas in the same space and they're all controlled through the same app and one person gets to see um, all the views from it. All of a sudden, maybe it's not just one robot following you in one space, but six robots. Would you make that connection that it could be just one person watching you through all of those cameras? Um, hopefully we're a little bit better at that. <laughs> um, but not everybody is. So again, this is a defense that I've tried to work on by creating indicators uh, for who's on what robot, um, that somebody is looking through that robot and is piggybacking on it, but there aren't great solutions uh, as, at this time. This is another fun one I did this week. <laughs> um, I taped a robot inside a, in a, inside a box and I had access to the, this robot and I got one of my undergrads to deliver it to my desk because it's fairly normal for me to get robots delivered when I'm not there. Um, but I, was a, I had connection to it. I was able to listen through the microphone and I was able to listen to conversations. Um, so this is another thing too, is if I ever send you a package, open it immediately. <laughs> 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 Like, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was actually a joke somebody else made, but just so the robots could breathe. <laughs> Is, yeah. Um, having, so I actually at the bar the other day, I had a gigantic box of robots delivered to me. Um, that was kind of fun too. I probably should have taken my own advice and opened those. I hope you didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this is another thing too, is that these robots are kind of uh, like a bug. Um, you know if you ever wanted to get into a space and plant something so you could listen to people, well, I mean, you have to get access first. But with some of these robots, you could honestly just l let them loose. Like put them down, get them in, and you don't ever have to get physical access. You can actually let the robot get physical access. Um, so this is one thing I'm currently working with a couple small companies in my city is setting up a penetration test, physical penetration test using the robots. Um, and the couple I've done so far have actually been pretty successful, um, but hopefully I can do a talk on those in a little bit. Um, this is another fun one. Uh, I, got the I got the robot to deliver Tim Hortons, which, I mean, I'm Canadian. I love Tim Hortons. Um, but I got the robot to deliver Tim Hortons to my lab for somebody else. And, I mean, you'd think people would know at this point, don't trust the robots, especially with me in the lab. Um, but, yeah, so I was able to get Tim somebody to open the door and let the robot in because it was delivering Tim Hortons. Um, and there's actually another academic institution that did a, a full research study on this where they had a robot sit outside a university dorm and asked to be let in. Um, and what ended up happening is, you know, a good number of people let the robot in. But then they decided to put an outfit on the robot and give it a bunch of cookies and make it look like it was a cookie delivery robot. And of course, everybody's like, I'm totally gonna let it in. This robot's doing a job. It has to do this. There might be some like hungry grad student. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, so this is a thing, it is some of the same things that I've seen other social engineers use to get into spaces I can do with these robots. And I mean, the defenses there are the same things you'd use in the other situations. Like, don't open the door. Maybe check that the robot's actually from a company that exists and offers robot delivery service. Um, maybe just take the cookies and leave the robot outside. There's a bunch of ways to deal with this. Um, but I mean, awareness is kind of important. And uh, as one of my friends mentioned earlier, once you get these robots inside, um, there's a lot of things they can do, like how do you know the robot's left? Are you gonna have somebody walk with it the entire time? Um, and if you don't, maybe the robot would stay like overnight, you wouldn't know, especially with something that's like this tall and could hide under a desk. All of a sudden you could use this robot to trigger like exit sensors and let somebody in after dark and that sort of thing too. So, I mean, maybe that's a defense to, that people start using soon with some of my attacks is checking your space before you leave to make sure there aren't uh, random robots. This one has affected me personally. <laughs> um, robot suicide is a serious thing. I'm sure many people have seen the robot that has uh, 
jumped into the fountain. <laughs> I wish. I'm uh, re really struggling, you know. Um, but with robot suicide, it's kind of interesting because if no one sees the robot suicide happen, they assume it's a bug in the robot. But when they actively see the robot, like, look at them, turn around, back up, and then go. <laughs> It is a little traumatizing, like I've been there. <laughs> but this is the thing is, um, with a lot of my research, especially in human-robot interaction, um, no matter like what discipline you're from, people like make bonds with the robots. There's actually like a Roomba-like fan group where people discuss like the best names for their Roombas and judge each other based on the names they've gotten for their Roombas, and they just like form these huge connections. It's like, oh, mine's also named that. Oh, they should have a play date. I'm like. They're Roombas, <laughs> right? So um, people really love the robots that they interact with. So you know, seeing a robot take an action you think is deliberate and damage itself is actually quite traumatizing to people. Um, so this is one uh, it's really hard to get ethics for, though. So haven't quite done enough studies on this, but I hope to. Um, but yeah, I had a friend do this once where uh, they controlled one of my robots that they thought wouldn't break off of a flight of stairs and it broke and I was very unhappy and have not fixed it yet because it's just been impossible and I'm very sad because my robot's dead. Um, I, and I guess the side effect of this too is in one paper they were discussing how a robot had fallen down the stairs, tumbled a bunch, flew into a flat screen TV, destroyed that, and that fell, destroyed something else, and I mean, robot suicide could lead to property damage too. Um, <laughs> and so this is another one too, is people get really upset when their pets don't interact with Roombas well. Um, the pets will get very stressed and can actually get very sick from a, uh, any sort of these robots being in their space, following them, um, attacking them, that sort of thing. I've also used this robot to control people's movement in space. Um, one of my friends is walking down a hall and I got this robot to come towards her and she like backed up and she was like freaking out about exactly how this robot was coming towards her. And then I pulled it back and she got closer and I moved the robot towards her again and it was this back and forth until all of a sudden she yelled out, Brittany, where the fuck are you? This robot won't leave me alone. <laughs> And of course, I was hiding under a desk controlling it, so I laughed like hysterically. And she's like, fuck you. <laughs> but this happens uh, fairly frequently. I, I do need a hand puppet, but I guess the robot's kind of my hand puppet, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like this is another thing too, um, is using these to careen into people's ankles. Uh, that's also uh, can cause a lot of damage. I accident accidentally did that once. I have video if anybody wants to see later. Um, but yeah, so you can also hurt people and animals and that causes a lot of stress. So the defenses against these are sort of the same thing. Lock the Roomba up, keep it separated from other things, um, kind of isolate it in what it does. And while I've been talking about Roombas, it, these attacks can be done with any of these robots pretty much. Um, except for maybe the delivery, because they might need a tray of some sort. Um, but it's anything that has a camera, that has movement, that can interact with people. Um, so all of these, or any other robot that meets the specifications, could do these things. So, like, yeah, all of these up until this point have been Roomba-likes. So now humanoids. This is one of my favorites. Um. So with the humanoids, uh, they have a lot more sensors. Uh, this one's got camera, sonar, it's also got infrared, it's also got a bunch of other sensors, eight microphones so it can tell exactly where everything's coming from. Um, but the most important thing here is its physicality, like exactly how we can use this body to achieve something separate. And again, we're separating from AI because um, we interact with the robots, with the physicality, um, much more like humans or animals than we would otherwise. And these, got, these ones have, uh, this is the now, it's also got Wi-Fi connectivity, a web interface, and you can program it however the hell you want. It's got Ubuntu on it. Um, it's got its own access point, a bunch of different stuff. So you can also use this robot in a bunch of interesting ways. Um, however you want, actually. I think one of the labs I have has an app. But one of the experiments we did was empathy. So we got a robot and a person to play uh, Sudoku together, and they take turns suggesting, you know, where which number goes where and why and all that sort of stuff. But then one of the ro uh, the robot says, 
weird things and it starts hitting itself, it's like, yeah, I want, you know, 20 at J13, which is not an option you can do in Sudoku because we played it like Battleship. Um, but the robot eventually said, like, I, I, I'm sick. I have a virus. And it was hitting itself. And, and people got really, like, visibly upset. And especially when the robot said, I'm afraid the researcher's going to have to reset me. And then the whole time up until this point, the robot's been like, hi, my name is now. But of course, we have to fucking reset the robot, right? Because that's what it's scared of. So we reset it and it comes on. And it's like, hello, my name is now. And people like, oh no. Like they were actually like head in hands and like looking down all this. They were completely upset that the robot was reset. And the, and the robot they'd been talking to, because like everybody's asking it like, you know, how's your day and that sort of stuff while they're playing Sudoku and, you know, um, the robot answered and they're so happy. Like, they're, they're smiling up until the robot gets reset. Um, and I have Tinny Tim from Futurama here because, like, what a cute robot. He's programmed to do backwards ease on signs. It's my favorite thing. Um, and, I mean, little disabled robot, like, I would totally, like, help it out, right? And that's something that in one of the episodes of Futurama that the robot does. Um, so I want to do an experiment on this. Again, ethics is kind of hard. Um, but, you know, that's something to watch out for as well is once we get to robots being in more social situations and uh, in points where you can interact with them more, you have to wonder, like, how are they going to use empathy against us? Likewise, I've done persuasion things. Uh, so for this one, I had a robot follow a flowchart for uh, how I was going to talk to people, and the person in the robot had to agree in this experiment on which face showed joy better. Um, who thinks face A shows joy better? Face B? Okay, that's weird. Okay. Because um, <laughs> they're mathematically equivalent. Like, it, there's, a, there's too many papers on this. I can send them to some of you. Um, but this is the thing, is they're the same, and, and no matter which face the person chose, the robot would automatically like either agree based on the flowchart or disagree. Um, and the interesting thing is like the persuasion worked. Um, I was able to convince every single uh, participant we had, some of them every single time, and this is something that you know humans maybe should be better at r than robots, is understanding human emotion. Um, but yeah, no. There's quotes like, oh, the robot taught me so much more about reading people's faces that I've never thought about. And you're like, it's a fucking flowchart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then you talk about stuff like this, right? Where maybe you've made a choice for yourself about how you're not going to do something or how maybe uh, something's a bad idea. And then there's me with a robot decides to be like, nah, do the bad thing. Like bad influence, like bad news bears robots would be so much fun. Um, but then another one that was fun was abuse of authority. Um, we set up a Milgram type experiment and with this one, uh, what happened was the robot tried to convince people to rename files by hand. Start with 10, then 50, then 100, then 500 and people would keep going. Um, and in some cases the robot was more effective than the human manager we put in, because uh, we obviously did one with humans, one with robots, and the robot was more effective in some situations in getting people to do menial tasks. Um, you can imagine how much that could be used for an abuse of authority and getting people to do things, to working more hours than they should, to, be, to put in more an effort, and that's really psychologically damaging as well. And like for all of those so far, the defenses are just really being aware because it is a social aspect. There's not a lot you can do uh, either physically or anything like that to handle, handle these robots affecting you. So it is a matter of understanding the threat and just having that awareness. And then of course, so this is a robot that's actually in a bank and actually sells financial products and um, gets, gets to interact with people on its own. The other thing I didn't mention, it's got a USB port in the back that you can just like flip a little thing and put in any USB you want. And it's got FTP servers, it's got its own access point. You can imagine this thing having access to everybody's accounts and all their financial information and being able to throw a USB, what could you do? I'm sure the people here have many different ideas. Um, I mean, and that's another thing too, is protecting against uh, attacks where robots are leveraged against you is maybe taking control of those things, but that's sort of the same issues we have when we deal with regular computers as well. Um, the other thing with these robots is um, 
Last week, actually, I got access to one in the UK, um, and by access to one, I mean they said, yeah, okay, if you can figure out how to get to it, sure. I was in uh, Zurich at the time, and so what we ended up doing was, uh, They'd been sending me a few documents, a few things, we were talking, and I was able to get their IP address from them, connect to the robot, and then uh, a few hours later decide to mess with them by sending messages through the robot. <laughs> and I got the robot to talk to them, and they messaged me like, wait, did you get in the robot? The robot's saying things. I, it shouldn't be saying this. And like freaked them out, that was kind of fun too. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's the thing is, when you, th when you think about this sort of thing where they have access to all your information, all of a sudden, um, they can also do aggressive sales, right? Because it's a robot, it's, you pretty much think it's a calculator, it should be better at figuring these things out than other people, especially when it comes to optimization problems. Um, so if you were in a bank and this robot offers you a mortgage at 20% and says it's the best it can do, what do you do, right? Especially when every bank is using the same robot because, I mean, that tends to happen is uh, companies using similar technologies as their competitors. Um, but then you get to this point that how will you fight this? How will you go against it? And again, it's awareness and maybe being that argumentative person that, I mean, I like to be. Um, yeah, so I kind of did a bit of a shorter talk because I would rather answer your questions about any attacks and defenses. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? So the answer was, is who are my participants in my studies? And pretty much everybody. Um, I've brought them to conferences with me. Um, I do a lot even with my roommate. She should know better by now. Um, the people in my lab, uh, anybody throughout the university, I've brought them to the mall a couple times as well. Um, and it's basically anywhere anybody will let me use my robot. So um, if you want me to bring it to your company, let me know. <laughs> uh, any other questions? because they can swear at it and say, fuck you. <laughs> um, so the question was, is why do people respond to the uh, robot in the Milgram type experiment better than the human type experiment? And yeah, it's honestly, we think it's probably because they could swear at the robot and say they didn't want to continue it and just like kept, yeah, the amount of swearing against that one was just like a huge spike. Any other questions? Oh, I have so, like so many. Um, yeah. Okay, so two things. <laughs> One, I've been told I'm going to be the eventual robot overlord overlord, so much so that I got a commission made for me. <laughs> and I forgot your question because I wanted to show that picture. <laughs> so that's like the next step. <laughs> Like, I mean, I've got the boots, but that's about it. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, wait, what, what was the question? <laughs> so when does it become artificial intelligence? Since you were the one that was doing it. So this is one of the best things about being an HRI, is the question was, um, when, do, when does AI come into this, right? And honestly, being in the HRI lab, I don't give a fuck. Uh, because we have people doing amazing things with AI, and I'm sure if I wanted to spend eight to ten months working on creating an AI that gets the right, like, pause to do some of these things, I could do it for a specific task, but, like, that's not what I'm interested in, right? I'm more interested in the physicality of the robot. So, I mean, honestly, we're going to get to a point eventually where um, you could easily replace me, the asshole, with an AI asshole. Um, so that's sort of what happens here is, uh, and why that definition is important. Yeah. So the question was, do, did any of the participants understand that it was me controlling the robot or did they think it was an AI? And the answer is they thought it was an AI. Um, none of them were aware that we were what is called a wizard of oz the robot. Um, 
to the point where they were excited. There's one quote from one person that said, I was so excited to see the robot think and understand and react in a way that it really felt was natural. Robots really impressed me. <laughs> and this is a CS student in third year. So this is another thing I often get is like, people like, oh, I'm a computer scientist. I am a tech person. I would never fall for that. And I'm like, you know how lazy I am? Like, I don't want to leave my building to go recruit people. And like, I know I do occasionally, but when I was like first doing experiments, I'm like, no. And I know that's usually a problem with academia, but in this case, it kind of helps because people are like, well, I would never do that. I'm like, well, what do you think the 60 participants were? They were people in their undergrad, masters, and professors, and they still fell for it. So that's a big thing is, um, yeah, people usually think it's an AI, even if it's a person. So we usually equate the two. Uh, any other questions? Don't understand. Can you? So the question was, uh, if there's a Roomba, uh, Roomba or a robot in a classroom, um, would anybody object to it being there? And I'm going to go home and test that. Is the answer? <laughs> uh, yeah. No. I. Somebody. Can somebody write that down for me? Uh, <laughs> next question. <laughs> so the question was, am I experimenting on you? And like, I didn't bring any robots just because I didn't want anybody to think that. Um, and that's usually where people ask if I'm the robot, to which I won't answer. Um, next question. Yeah. Have you done anything with social isolation? I've not done anything with social isolation. Um, be one, because uh, it's not... Ethics is really hard, and that's the thing, is most people, when they hear a robot talk, especially robot interacting with humans, there's so many questions that come up, so much ethics that comes up, that even trying to get across a, I'm going to use a robot to talk to somebody, is like a three-month ethics process. So I haven't tried to deal with people that you'd think are maybe a little more uh, protected. Oh, okay. It's always just a person in a robot in a room, and that's it. I'm always gone. Oh, no, no, no. You have a confederate, so it's free. The experimenter would be in a room with confederate and a robot. The confederate and the robot refuse to play with them. I don't know what you mean by confederate. Uh, assistant. I'm like, As oh, OK, no. Um, no, so it's always just a robot and a person left in a room. Um, whenever I come in, I'm like, hey, you're interacting with a robot today. Uh, the robot's going to tell us stuff after. Have fun. So there's never any researchers or assistants or anybody in the room. It's always just the robot and the person. So they're isolated. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question was, are there experiments where robots interact with one person and ignore another person when there are two people in a room? Is that right? Um, yeah, so there's been tons of that done with things like robot gaze. Um, so robots looking at people, uh, that's a huge effect because if the robot doesn't look in the right place, people feel really uncomfortable, right? Um, so yeah, there's tons of uh, research done with that and people get really upset. They feel neglected, ignored. Um, there's one example of a robot that actually delivered snacks in uh, an office building and the robot would visit people in, in different orders and it would come on like Wednesdays and Fridays and people would actually like People that normally work from home would come in on those days to interact with the robot because they liked the relationship they had with the robot um, and other things too. And they would get, actually get pissed if the robot would talk to like, there was one woman the robot would talk to first and people like, the robot's got a crush on her. Like, I don't understand why the robot doesn't come to me first. Why is it going to her? And we get really pissed off. And they had like a whole monologue on this. Um, so it is important for the robot to look at everybody and to treat them equally. Otherwise, people feel preferential treatment. Um, next question. Uh, somewhere in the states, um, they didn't. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, where was it done? And uh, that last experiment was somewhere in the States. I can find the paper again. I don't think they mentioned the company, but um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I'll let you know later. Yeah, so there's a, um, the point is, is that um, there are different cultures that you deal with with the robots, and it is very obvious um, when different cultures are interacting. That's something we've had to correct for in the universities especially, is because we do have a very good mix in Canada of uh, different cultures. Uh, so much so that I think there's only like four North Americans out of 20 in my lab or something. Um, so we have like a really good mix, and the cultural bias does change things a lot. Um, that was one thing that came with the persuasive robots is um, the results I said earlier, we did, those were already corrected for cultural differences because we found that the Asian cultures did actually agree with the robots way more and almost conceded on every point. Um, question. Did I locate the uncanny valley? We need to have very large discussions about that, probably later and over drinks, uh, because that's, uncanny valley is really interesting. Um, my favorite example is actually like zombies are uncanny valley. That's why they creep people out. That's why people are scared of them. Um, and I've recently found out I have robot uncanny valley. There's some robots that are not robot -y enough for me, and I just like want to put them out of their misery. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so this happened, right, exactly, double tap it, and like, I was sitting there, I'm like, okay, so there's this robot, it was at CCC, there's like this robot that kept going in a circle, and I don't even want to call it a robot, like, oh, it made me so uncomfortable, I'm like, okay, so it's running on pneumatics, but like, I'm pretty sure I can take off its head, I can take off all of its legs, I can cut it loose, and then like, just destroy it, I'm like, it doesn't need to exist, because I was so uncomfortable with it, because it wasn't robot -y enough for me, so I found the robot on Caddy Valley. Um, but yeah, so that's, it's more per person, uh, is what I'm finding. Uh, I have very strong uncanny belly. Um, yeah, question. So, would you the robot say sadness if a person says F off, make the robot appear sad and they respond accordingly? There are so many great studies on this. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question was, are there any, um, any studies on robot sadness. And I actually had uh, a friend publish a paper in the last year on the effect on researchers for doing experiments where robots are sad because it psychologically damages the researchers so much because the robots are sad. So like, I mean, we've gone meta on this already. Um, but yeah, we have plenty of studies where robots, um, for example, especially with kids, holy crap, do kids abuse robots? It actually terrifies me reading these papers. Um, so there's one where the robot builds like a really nice tower and then um, they tell the kid, can you go and kick it down? And the kid's like, yeah, sure, bam. <laughs> and then the robot, it was programmed to get on its knees and start bawling to see what the, ro what the child reaction was. The reactions, that was more scary because the kids like half the time were like, whatever. <laughs> and the rest of the time were like, oh, it's sad, neat. <laughs> like. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, so, so sadness is a big thing. Um, next question. Okay, so in the experiment with the robot that tries to get into the university dorm using cookies, it was a Roomba, but with shelves. They're called turtle robots. Um, Oh, and the best thing I didn't even mention about that one um, was that when groups came up to the robot to talk to it, and like, yeah, it was like a room with shelves, um, they joked like, ha ha ha, it might be a bomb. <laughs> and those people were more likely to let it in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they identified the threat and they fucked it up. <laughs> uh, next question. Rather, you can't just keep redoing standard psychology experiments. 
Right. So the uh, statement was is that we seem to be recreating uh, s social science experiments, and the answer is yes. We basically grab one of those, and it's like, huh. I'm going to switch this person with a robot and do it again. And that's what we do. Um, but in 10 years from now, um, what is the uh, environment going to look like? Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to say sex bots are a great start. <laughs> and like, I mean, honestly, who, who doesn't make a sex bot when they make robots? Um, Okay, I will have to talk to this person. Um, but okay. Oh yeah, no, I talked to Render Man. Um, yeah. So this is the thing: is like ten years from now, I'm like it's hard because robotics is really, really bad in this in the sense that we don't share code. None of the robots are standardized. Everything is a fucking mess. I'm honestly like worse than you think. Um, like the robot that has Ubuntu on it. Um, after it went off warranty, we tried to throw a, no, a new operating system on it, and the moment we did that, it has a chip in it that you can't get to without destroying it that overwrites any changes done to the operating system, even patches. Yeah, so that's a major problem. Um, and like the robot operating system, ROS, has so many fucking issues with it. They finally did a second version, um, but I get to deal with that soon. Um, especially one of my friends is dealing with nuclear robotics where they use these robots in nuclear facilities and they're really not secure. Um, and this is a huge problem. So that's something else I deal with. Uh, but yeah, so 10 years from now, either it's just going to make everything worse or hopefully I can keep doing research that makes it better. So if any of you have any more attacks or defenses or want to help me out with this, I'm still working on my thesis. Hopefully it's done soon, but you can have a part by giving me more ideas. Um, any more questions? Have you uh, done the opposite where you had a robot responding algorithmically through a human? That's an AI, not a robot. Did you not see the definition? <laughs> 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 Thank you. I can pull it up again. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? No? Okay, I think we're good. Um, thank you very much for listening, and come find me later.